Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Enes Ramnath from Founding Fuel. Uh, welcome to the masterclass with Sangeet Paul Chowdhury. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I'm sure all of us will have a lot to take away from this masterclass. Uh, first, let me welcome Sangeet to masterclass. Uh, he's joining us from Singapore. Uh, good evening, Sangeet. Uh, it must be 9 p.m. now, right? Yeah, that's correct. Good evening, Ramnath. Very, very glad to be here and looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Uh, uh, we, are, we, we were actually planning to have this masterclass from Bangalore last month. Uh, Sangeet uh, was to travel, travel here to receive the Distinguished Alumnus Award from IM Bangalore, uh, but the convocation got postponed and there were travel advisories and restrictions all around because of COVID-19. Uh, so here we are on Zoom. Uh, obviously, this is not the only thing that uh, coronavirus has changed. Uh, it, has completely, it is completely disrupting uh, businesses, economies, uh, politics, uh, and society. It almost seems as if we are uh, living in a different world. And uh, we couldn't have hoped for a better person than Sangeet uh, to help us make sense of this world. Uh, the big changes that's happening all around us. Uh, Sangeet has had a ringside view of technology's uh, huge impact. Uh, he advises C-suit advisor, uh, executives, uh, top officials in governments and multilateral organizations uh, such as ILO on the power of platforms and the right way to use them. Uh, thus, he has not only been tracking the, uh, tracking the evolution of platforms, uh, but he has also been shaping its evolution. Uh, so this is a part of Founding Fuel's efforts to understand uh, how to thrive uh, in a volatile world today. Uh, to engage with Sangeet, uh, we have our team uh, from Founding Fuel, uh, Indrajit Gupta, uh, uh, hi IG, uh, and uh, CS Swaminathan, uh, uh, hi Swami. Uh, we also have Charles Assisi, who will be engaging with you on the YouTube chat window. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please post there. Uh, we have also invited uh, four distinguished guests from our network, um, and I'll introduce them to you now. Uh, Anuradha Rao, uh, former Deputy Managing Director of India's largest bank, uh, State Bank of India, where she led the strategy and digital uh, for the bank. Uh, some of you uh, will know her from our masterclass on data privacy. Then we have R. Srinivasan, uh, Professor at IAM Bangalore, uh, he teaches strategy to his students in Bangalore and in Germany, and uh, he advises startups and has written highly regarded uh, case studies on platforms. And then we have Haresh, uh, Haresh Chawla. Uh, he needs no introduction to our audience, uh, a business builder, a startup investor, and uh, a much sought after thought leader and advisor on uh, digital transformation. And then we have R. Sriram, uh, who is again no stranger to Founding Fuel community. Uh, he co-founded uh, Crossword Bookstores, and uh, he now heads uh, uh, Next Practices Retail. Uh, welcome to Masterclass, uh, hi everyone. And uh, 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 Sangeet, uh, before I really get into the Masterclass, uh, I wanted to start with a question. Uh, you, you are still in the lockdown mode in Singapore, uh, maybe for weeks now. Correct. Uh, what does this uh, lockdown mean to you personally? How has it impacted your life and your work? Uh, I, I think it, it's certainly impacted my, my work because, uh, you know, uh, what I do is very much a contact sport in the sense that uh, I do a lot of keynote speaking, I do a lot of advisory, and all of that does not happen just over video. Uh, so um, uh, it, it, it certainly has impacted that. It's, it's created new behaviors in clients who in the past would not have wanted to do things remotely, but are now increasingly doing things remotely. I've done board meetings remotely, which would never have happened in the past. So it's been uh, interesting from that perspective. Uh, at a personal level, uh, you know, it's been a good excuse to get um, my daughter out of school for the next three months. Uh, so it's just getting us uh, a lot of good time at the family level. That's, that's how things are. Oh, fantastic. Uh, so, uh, in this masterclass, we are going to deal with uh, multiple complex subjects. You know, platform model uh, is complex by itself uh, because it forces us to question a lot of assumptions uh, we made earlier about uh, tech and business and uh, COVID-19. And COVID-19 is complex because there is uh, uncertainty all around. 
uh, every day brings us new information that uh, simply shatters the ideas we took for granted for ages right uh, there seems to be no precedent no living memory of a disaster of this scale uh, so we are going to uh, we are discussing two very complex things right uh, so to make it simple and useful uh, we have broken down the master class into two broad segments uh, the first is a big reset uh, what we call the big reset uh, the coronavirus pandemic changed how the world operates uh, what the impact of that on platforms and tech businesses in general and uh, the second part is operating in the new normal uh, what should governments uh, businesses uh, society and individuals do uh, today uh, to operate better in the post covid uh, 19 world uh, what are some of the examples and what are some of the use cases uh, but before we get into uh, the core of our discussions today uh, uh, sangeet uh, i i would uh, like you to give a 3 minute introduction to platforms uh, so all of us attending this are on the same page sure so um the word platform uh, you know now we we are way uh, ahead into uh, understanding platforms uh, as as a global community but the word platform in general has for the long time uh, been uh, variously understood and there's not been one single definition so the way i think about platforms is how platforms work as a business model and in order to distinguish uh, what platforms Uh, or, or to really lay out the boundaries of what a platform is, I can tr- contrast that with what I call a pipeline, which is the traditional model of doing business, where you, uh, where the business works like a like a linear pipeline. You create value, you push it out, and you uh, give it to the end customer. And there's this linear, perfectly controlled form of logic of value creation and value distribution that a pipeline business follows, and that's what. Uh, we've seen in the industrial economy most of the businesses from that era follow that model what a platform does is instead of providing this linear logic of value creation and instead of just creating a product and pushing it to the end user it provides an infrastructure for third parties to connect for producers and consumers of value to connect and interact with each other and it sets the rules of governing those interactions so if you think of uh, if if i just take a couple of examples um, you know a hotel works like a pipeline but airbnb for example works like a platform and today it's not just the startups that are building platforms what's more interesting is how you can reimagine traditional structures how can you reimagine disease diagnosis as a platform how can you reimagine energy markets as a platform that's that's the real opportunity that we have today to create systemic solutions using a platform business model so pipes versus platform and i guess that is one of the uh, key uh, metaphors that we have to uh, have in mind uh, before we really get into the core of our uh, uh, master class and uh, uh, and thank you for the very crisp introduction uh, sangeet uh, let's now get to the crux of the matter uh, how has uh, covid 19 changed platforms uh, especially if you can uh, dwell a little bit on uh, the acceleration of existing trends and uh, versus the migration of value the fundamental shifts that are happening because of covid uh, if you can start with that that'll be fine. yeah so i think uh, covid 19 you know whether you think of it from the lens of platforms or you think generally in terms of the impact on business impact on systems in general uh, covid 19 has uh, is uh, you know can be seen uh, at least in in uh, in two lenses one is what trends is it accelerating or decelerating so if we take that um, uh, you know lens uh, it's essentially uh, uh, the shift towards online for certain things like for example remote work or uh, online groceries for example uh, has accelerated because of covid-19 so it's uh, it's a shift that was already happening but it's been accelerated because of a sudden change in behavior um, and that acceleration is now playing out um the other way to think about it is you know to think about it in terms of value is the value for an entire value network uh is is it increasing or is it decreasing is value migrating from an existing player to a new player uh and the way to think about it is uh to really look at the specific uh changes that are happening on the demand side and on the supply side because if there's a significant shift in demand side behavior and somebody else can capture that behavior they have the opportunity to 
to orchestrate the rest of the value network around themselves. I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, think of uh, the media industry uh, or, or movies in particular. Uh, movies used to launch directly to theaters and uh, a large part of their ROI would come during this period when the theater would run the movie and the theaters would have a windowing period when the movie could not be shown on a distribution channel apart from the theater. So it couldn't be shown on Netflix, for example. Now, what's happened is that there's been a demand side shift. Theaters are shut down, and so that windowing goes out of the window, literally, right? And for the first time, that negotiating power that theaters had with studios goes down. And for the first time, there's an extended opportunity. It's not just a one-off opportunity. It's an industry-wide opportunity for studios to test a new business model with streaming, uh, uh, you know, launching new movies directly to streaming and seeing if they can actually recover their investment through an alternate channel. And the longer the lockdown lasts, the more the time for experimentation, the more the opportunity to test this business model, and the more the likelihood that in the long term, the bargaining power will shift away from um, a movie uh, a theater to a movie studio, uh, a movie creation studio. So that's a demand side shift, which could lead to a potential value migration. Uh, think of a supply side shift as well. So. Uh, what differentiates uh, streaming from live uh, from TV or today the reason network TV still exists to a large extent is because they have access to live content, uh, sports, uh, live entertainment, uh, and that streaming com uh, streaming uh, businesses like Netflix and Amazon do not have. So that's a supply side factor that's changing because that entire uh, corpus of content is now not being created. For example, IPL is not happening this year, so that whole content is gone. And so what's going to happen is network TV is going to come to streaming uh, players and it, they're going to start licensing uh, content from there. So we're going to see new models in which uh, value is going to move around in the industry. And again, there's going to be bargaining power shift on the supply side. So what happens is that when these kinds of bargaining power shifts happen, you start seeing concentration with certain players. And whether you think of it as a platform or not, once a player has that concentration, they have the ability to extract, to, to create new value, extract opportunity out of it. If they have the resources, they do it themselves. But in today's world, in a connected world, even if they don't have the resources, they can orchestrate a new network um, around themselves. And that's where new platform opportunities can be identified. So that's why I feel we are in such a unique time where new uh, behaviors are being conditioned. So demand side shifts are happening. Uh, entire supply chains are being disturbed, not just logistically, but as the, with the movie industry, it could be another kind of disruption. And because of these two shifts, power will shift and new opportunities to orchestrate the value network will, will emerge from this uh, scenario. Sure. Uh, huge shifts in both uh, demand side and in the supply side. Uh, uh, I'd like to bring in uh, Indrajit Gupta here. Uh, IG for yes, you. thanks, Ram. Um, hi, Sangeet. Uh, I just wanted to kind of um, uh, carry forward that conversation on on what you call the boredom uh, monetization of boredom. I think in one of your newsletters, right? I yeah. found that fascinating. Um, I want to pick, take an example of of both, say, a streaming service like Netflix, and contrast that with the how the COVID. Uh, uh, affects really a traditional player like Disney. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happens post the lockdown? Uh, what sort of scenarios uh, present itself as we go through this period of lockdown and what might happen post the lockdown to these two players? Right. So, um, and, and again, you could apply this thinking to literally any company. And that's where, the, uh, uh, you know, that's where we start drawing scenarios and, and see what we have to believe in to, to uh, determine future scenarios. Um, what, um, what uh, uh, you know, when, when you think of uh, a streaming player like Netflix, uh, with the two shifts that I talked about, there's a demand side shift. So there's power shifting away from movie theaters to uh, streaming channels. And so there's an opportunity for the streaming players to figure out a new business model, a new revenue model uh, by which they can provide the other way back to the movie studio. And this has happened in China already where uh, Huanzi uh, studio uh, directly launched with uh, one of ByteDance's platforms and they structured a licensing plus advertising share deal, which worked out very well for them. Um, 
especially because there are so many people under lockdown. So it, it worked out very well for them. So there's an opportunity to identify these new um, revenue models for, for streaming companies. And uh, really, uh, for a, a streaming business, the biggest uh, cost driver uh, at this point is the is loss in uh, recurring usage. And so identifying new opportunities like this, especially as streaming wars heat up, is going to be important for survival in the midterm for some of these businesses, because there are multiple large businesses with uh, varying levels of pockets coming in uh, to this to this game. Disney Plus is uh, also, you know, uh, uh, getting into it, it, it quite effectively. So that's one of the uh, effects that will happen on the streaming business, for example. Another uh, opportunity, as I mentioned, could be for uh, new models of licensing to be developed. Uh, even uh, new content creation models might end up getting developed if some form of lockdown persists over the long term. Because if you uh, think of the uh, the studio cal calendar through the year, this is typically the period when a lot of new content is created and now studios are all shut down. So uh, if the lockdown persists, there's, pos there's a possibility and we'll have to look out for that. So I don't want to conjecture too, too much, but there's a possibility that we might see new models in which content is being created uh, remotely or new forms of content which can be created, for example, uh, just CGI based content. Uh, or uh, you know, just more solo performances like stand-up comedy, for example, which could uh, start uh, coming out. So, so that's um, you know potentially some ways streaming could be impacted. Now, if you take a, a company like Disney, for example, if you think of uh, uh, Disney's business, one of their biggest uh, revenue drivers is the amusement park, and so amusement parks have been shut down. And uh, the longer this lasts, the more uh, you are. Uh, going to see an impact on on a business model that relies on travel and that relies on uh, close contact of uh, a large group of people so um, when we think of disney um, you know i would I, I i usually think of what what are the core assets a business has and uh, what are the core uh, network relationships the business has so uh, from a disney perspective Disney has huge intellectual property in, in the form of various characters that it's created over time. And uh, Disney has this um, uh, approach of creating universes around those characters, whether it's the Marvel uh, multiverse or whether it's, uh, you know, the whole original Disney universes across amusement parks, merchandising. So there's an opportunity to Disney to really rethink uh, what could it do with its characters? Uh, uh, and uh, one one opportunity would be to rethink what could an amusement park look like in a world that has gone virtual. Uh, how would you think about uh, unleashing uh, interactivity and creativity with characters for users? Uh, it could it be a virtual world, a game? Um, uh, so anything uh, that replaces the the experience of the amusement park and in future augments that experience in this. Uh, Fashion, fashion would this would be the right opportunity to create that and Disney has in the past tried to invest in this direction so this would again be the right time to to do that for example so those are you know certain uh, ways I would think about it again uh, the more you think about what assets they have what networks relationships they have the more uh, potential scenarios emerge from there so um, that's uh, again my 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 the uh, my my point with all of this is not to conjecture it's just to say look at the demand side shifts, look at the supply side shifts, see where concentration is happening, see where commoditization is happening, and you'll identify opportunities for new business models with that uh, lens. Thank you so much. Ram, uh, Ram, would you like to go with it? You know, this COVID pandemic has highlighted the need for nonprofits to deliver impact at scale. Uh, is the platform business model for nonprofits different from that for for-profits? Can you please elaborate? Yeah, I think this is a, a very interesting uh, question. I think architecturally, at, at a very fundamental level, the two are not very distinct. The two become distinct when you start thinking about ownership and incentives. So in a not-for-profit business model, the funding, for example, for a not-for-profit platform or a platform in a not-for-profit world may be less centralized than the funding in a venture capital world, for example. And so the needs to accrue value back to the owner may be less in uh, a not-for-profit world versus in a for-profit world. Now this uh, releases uh, or, or this changes uh, 
several variables. So for example, in a, in a for-profit world, when you build a platform, you always try to identify what is the control point? What is that single inimitable asset which you can control because of which the rest of the ecosystem becomes dependent on you. And I'll just give a couple of examples for Facebook and Google. It's our data because our data is owned by them and they uniquely control it. They orchestrate whole ecosystems around it uh, for Google on Android. Uh, Google Maps is a control point because it is so expensive to create mapping data and because Google has done it for years, it's difficult to replicate it. And so Samsung and other companies have to rely on Google and, and cannot, uh, you know, work around the rules of uh, Google's open handset alliance. So those, these are examples of control points. When you have a control point, you uh, try to uniquely own it, you prevent it from spreading. And, and so you try to monetize uh, that ownership of the control point in a, in a not for profit or societal context, the need for singular ownership of that control point goes down, which is why you have a greater uh, possibility for releasing important components of your platform into the commons and allowing a larger ecosystem of innovation around what is on in the commons. And this is very different from what we call an open platform in the, in the business world, because an open platform in the business world is anything that allows participation for non employees. Uh, and uh, that in itself uh, does not mean that the most valuable parts of the platform are being opened for for to a large extent. It's only those parts that are being opened, which augment the value creation capability of the platform owner. But in a not for profit world, you could open a lot of uh, several parts of the platform. For example, if Google, uh, if, if Android was in a, or Google was uh, working in a not for profit world, Google Maps would be completely open. It would allow anybody to use it, augment it, uh, expand it, even in ways beyond which, uh, you know, it, it's, it's done today because today it's uh, only uh, surface level augmentations that are done, which help to make maps stronger. But tomorrow you could, uh, in, a, in an open or in a commons world, you could take maps, fork it and create your own version of it. And that's how uh, in a not for profit world, the ability to translate platform assets into the commons and unleash greater innovation around it creates the ability to harness uh, or, or to, to provide solutions at much larger scale. Now, the challenge, uh, I would say, again, you know, we talked uh, a lot about this from the perspective of incentives. There, there's no incentive for value centralization as in the for profit world. The challenge, again, is that because of a lack of incentives, some of the brightest minds may not be working on some of the most important problems. And uh, because of this, uh, we, we probably haven't seen as much impact as we could have seen in a world where assets, platform assets could be in the commons. Uh, not for profits in themselves have their own uh, traditional uh, challenges of moving fast or thinking in terms of platforms. Um, and very often when they don't interpret the idea of a platform, well, they may just absorb it to uh, make it work in a way that best suits the existing pro processes. So I, I guess the point is that there's a lot of opportunity to use platforms for real large scale impact in the not for profit world. Uh, and especially if we start seeing new actors uh, coming in without legacy baggage to come in and innovate around this. Uh, hi, Sangeet. Can, can I take this up? Yeah. So, uh, you know, you talked about uh, concentration and commoditization. I think, I think, I mean, clearly platforms and we've seen them do that. Uh, and if you divide the world into two parts, there are companies that get this and companies that don't. So there are platforms like Amazon, Google, Facebook, whatever platform, they, these are the companies that get it. They have the talent, they have the capability, they have the infrastructure, they have the knowledge, they have the databases, they have the consumer connect. And there are these traditional companies that don't have all this. And they were working towards building these capabilities, but suddenly this has come as a shock. So is the prognosis, what is the prognosis for a traditional firm? Because everybody cannot be Amazon, cannot be become Google. And suddenly the power to the platforms becomes enormous because the algorithms will be at work. Uh, is it a race to the bottom for a lot of traditional firms and, and therefore losses in jobs as well? Um, yeah, so if, if you think of, um, so, if, so let me answer that question uh, in a pre-COVID and in a COVID world, right? Even in a pre-COVID world, um, it's, it's not practical for, or it's, it's not pragmatic for um, every company to try to compete with Amazon or to try to compete with Google. What's more important is to uh, 
figured out essentially two things. One, uh, if a platform is entering your space, what is the right way to work with them or in the ecosystem and avoid commoditization. In some cases, you cannot avoid commoditization. In many, in, in some cases, you, you can if you think strategically about it. So uh, uh, if I give just a very simple example of that, uh, and this is again uh, a case study negotiating power, right? Um, think of Apple Pay. Apple Pay is going country to country and talking to banks to get them on board. Uh, when Apple Pay goes into a country, it negotiates with the bank. If the bank agrees to the terms, that's great. If they don't, they go to the next bank. And one way or the other, in, in the long term, every bank will have to come on board on Apple Pay's terms. Uh, what happened in Sweden was a bit different, where the banks came together and created a common payment mechanism and then asked Apple Pay to be part of their payment mechanism. So they flipped who the platform was going to be. By the time Apple Pay had the discussion, 70% of the population was using that payment mechanism. So one uh, important aspect is that if a platform is really coming in, and if it's one of these big, uh, you know, large platforms, which are way more powerful, not just because of a business model, uh, but because they, they have a cross leverage business model across many other industries, many other profit pools, because of which they can, uh, make investment decisions that you can't make playing in just one industry. Um, so that's the first uh, thing in a, in a pre-COVID world. The second thing is that if, if a platform is coming or not coming, you still have to think through what is the future value network going to look like and how can you reorganize it in your favor? How can you prevent yourself uh, from getting commoditized? Uh, how, how, how can you uh, ensure that uh, to a large extent, the, the control point does not migrate away from you. And very often what that means is that a critical demand side factor, like a decision-making capability or uh, uh, an ability to understand users through their data, that does not move to some other uh, player or a critical supply side capability does not move to some other player. So in a pre-COVID world as well, you had to rethink your business model based on how your value network was and what kind of movements in, in the supply side or demand side control points would happen. But now, uh, as you mentioned, uh, in, a, in, a, in the current scenario and depending on how the next months and couple of years play out, um, there, there, there is no clear scenario about that. But depending on how that plays out, a variety of factors may have uh, a role to play over here. One, as you mentioned, was platforms have algorithms doing the job versus people doing the job and that is anyway working and keeps working and keeps improving, especially when there's a large consumer base uh, training these algorithms right now. Uh, so, um, there's, so, so there's definitely um, going to be a, a, an increase in power of platforms in general. And I believe that that's also because there's the scalability of their business model has allowed them to respond to COVID or be, uh, or, or to, to, uh, to make transformative moves in really short period of time, much more easily than for traditional businesses. So I, I believe that uh, irrespective of how long this uh, period lasts and what the various manifestations of uh, this period are, whether it is, uh, you know, lockdown or whether it is a lack of travel or whether it is something else, how these various factors play out, the larger platforms are going to get strengthened even further during this period. At the same time, companies that have um, uh, that have been part of the value network of these platforms and have seen a, an important demand side or supply side shift away from them, they will become increasingly commoditized. And if you take just a simple example, and this is not for large businesses, but just a simple example, if you think of restaurants uh, right now and you see restaurant aggregators uh, or delivery companies like uh, Uber Eats, for example, um, there's a clear uh, shift in value ha happening over there, both on the demand side and the supply side. So demand side, there's a behavior shift uh, because of which it does not make sense. Uh, you can't op keep a restaurant open. And uh, um, when you don't have the restaurant open, paying high rental rates in a prime real estate area does not make sense anymore. And so what might that, what that might lead to is a supply side shift in value as well, because as restaurants start shutting down, these aggregators can set up dark kitchens identify the, uh, from the data what kind of things sell, which restaurants sell, which specific kind of items, and just license that or, or in some cases even deconstruct that or just hire the chef from that restaurant and move all of that into their dark kitchens. And uh, once that's moved into the dark kitchen, uh, dark kitchens are not 
located in central areas, they're located in the suburbs, they're located closer to delivery. So the entire economic model of the dark kitchen works out much better. So what would happen in an extreme scenario like the restaurant versus the aggregator is that the value or the control point on both the supply side, which is access to uh, the best food creation capability and on the demand side, which is access to uh, a, a user base that's locked down, both migrate away from the restaurant to the aggregator. So this would be an extreme kind of case that might play out. And the longer that plays out, um, the, the companies in between start getting squeezed. If, if, if they're not commoditized, uh, I, I mean, if they continue to survive, they get commoditized, but in many cases, they may not even survive. So if you just take this restaurant uh, example, this is an extreme example, unlikely to happen in many other places. So I don't want to uh, you know, make extreme predictions, but I'm trying to use this just as an illustrative case to explain how demand side and supply side control points can completely shift and commoditize the players in between. No, but in a sense, I agree. The only challenge is that we've seen this. Craigslist is a billion dollar company, but destroyed over $50 billion of print advertising. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we are, are we going to see a massive acceleration and therefore should, I guess, somebody step in because you're overall destroying massive value for the economy while creating some value for the platform. So I think, I think that's another question that my sure. guess it will come up as we discuss. So regulation, I, I, I absolutely believe that regulation should, should step in at this point. And uh, that is, that has to happen at two levels. It's, it's both. Uh, I think the stimulus side of regulation is much more difficult because uh, it's just, uh, you know, the way stimulus packages are designed right now, they are not in the favor of small businesses, uh, especially as dispersed through banks. That just does not work in the small businesses' favor. Uh, but uh, from the perspective of regulating the large platforms, uh, they should absolutely, um, this absolutely needs to be regulated for the, for the entire yeah, value. Professor that Kinney has a question on that. We'll yeah. move to him. Hi, Sangeet. The question is, uh, going back to the metaphor that you have between pipelines and platforms, uh, regulation in the pipeline world was pretty much similar to the walls in the, in the pipeline. And, and the walls are typically public. The public, uh, the government does the regulation. When we have a platform business where the supply side is defrag very fragmented and the demand side is fragmented, the onus is on the big platforms to regulate themselves. The standards the regulation have to be set by the giants and, and typically being for profit, being diversified into multiple businesses, being building a core which they want to leverage or monetize across multiple uh, places, there's very little chance that these big giants are going to set standards for themselves. Mm -hmm. You talked about streaming, just, just give me a minute. And given the fragmentation of the supply side, there's no way somebody is going to be uh, regulating the content, like for instance, censorship. There's nobody who's going to do quality control uh, in, in a physical infrastructure. Restaurants had FSSA licensing. In a cloud kitchen, there's not going to be licensing at all because we're just depending on chefs and uh, patrons. Right? So how, how do we think that we should regulate in a for-profit giant who are building infrastructure? So when, when you think about regulation in this case, what, what problem are we trying to solve with that? Are we trying to solve... Uh, the, the commoditization of participants or the exploitation of players in the ecosystem? Or um, are, are we trying to solve for, because the quality question was different from, from uh, this overall exploitation question or, or is it anti-competitive measures? Um, what specifically, maybe we could take one of these and, and uh, discuss that. So, the, so the, the basic question therefore is looking at how fair is the product or service? Is the, is the pricing fair? Is the product service fair? So the, the, let's take the fairness uh, question. Yeah, so, uh, so again, uh, this is where, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of, so in, in, in a pipeline world, when, whenever uh, the fairness question was applied to, to pricing, for example, it was always about, is there price gouging? Is there too much, uh, you know, is, is, is uh, it's the over extraction of uh, uh, price. Uh, what the first thing that happens in a platform world is that it's a two-sided market. So, so you also need, al always need to figure out uh, which side is being subsidized and not apply this regulation model over there at all. In fact, uh, what should be uh, applied over there is uh, to see 
the cost to the participant in some other format. Maybe it is the maybe there's a specific cost to uh, the loss of privacy. Maybe there's a specific cost to um, you know over dependence on the platform. So uh, that becomes much more difficult to regulate than something as simple as price. Uh, on the uh, on so related to price is a quality. Let me give you an example. In the COVID world, yeah. supposing I crowdfund uh, vaccine product production. And uh, there's a crowdfunding of vaccines, and there's so many different sets of people who are doing vaccines. And uh, there's an aggregator of uh, vaccines who are giving it to the patients. And, and we have no FDA, CDC, ICMR who is doing this. Right. And there's likelihood that such kinds of things can happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I think that is where regulators need to step in and say exactly which of these things. Uh, so, this is a question of who of division of responsibility is it the responsibility of the platform or the participant to guarantee the quality of um, the the product or service that is running through the platform so this is where regulators have to step in and uh, make clear distinctions on where it's a platform's responsibility where it is not a platform's responsibility and to a large extent this is uh, the kind of regulation that has been uh, uh, that's um, that's uh, you know that's uh, required in in, in uh, industries where the cost of failure of the interaction is very high. Uh, so, uh, I mean, specifically, I would say uh, that the division of responsibility um, uh, of um, various platform activities, not just uh, the quality in itself, that, that is something that should be regulated in terms of how that is being uh, divided. Um, the problem is uh, usually is that uh, regulation in many of these cases lags innovation by several iterations uh, of, of failures. And we saw something similar, I believe, with Lending Club, for example, where it was not properly regulated in terms of, uh, um, uh, you know, the kinds of what would normally be considered growth hacking and showing different kinds of pricing to different kinds of people. But in a financial uh, services scenario, you would not, uh, you know, it, that would have to be regulated. Uh, so. Um, so it, it comes down to which parts of, uh, you know, depending on which ecosystem you're playing in and, and uh, what the outcome of, of the transaction is going to be for the consumer, uh, there should be a clear regulation. Uh, I mean, what needs to be regulated is how that responsibility is divided between the platform and the, and the producer. Uh, uh, yeah, hi, uh, Sandeep. If I can ask a slightly India specific question. Sure. Actually, uh, whatever impact is going to be there on the economy uh, of the whole lockdown, a disproportionate uh, you know, amount of pressure is going to come on the rural economy. Mm -hmm. Now, do you? there are existing platforms uh, in India, uh, especially the India strategy you yourself have highlighted in your article. Now, who will, uh, is it possible to build uh, a new model of uh, for the rural economy on the back of the existing platforms or do you see a role for a new kind of platform? If so, what would be the shape and form of that? Right. So, um, so uh, to answer that, I would, I would think about what is the, what is the difference that we are thinking uh, comes in in the case of the rural economy versus the urban economy. Um, one is potentially, um, the simplest one is potentially access, right? Uh, but more um, evolved differences or, or more uh, nuanced differences are uh, user authentication or user identity and user reputation um, you, uh, or, um, you know, creditworthiness, for example. So uh, what's what I would expect is that what what's needed uh, what's needed uh, when we move from an urban perspective to a rural perspective is not a fundamental shift in the business model of the platform but a shift in the types of underlying digital infrastructures that are required so there might be a new form of digital infrastructure required to uh, validate or, or, or authenticate users which is not possible with existing systems or there might be a new form of digital infrastructure required uh, or digital asset required to um, determine the the creditworthiness or quote unquote quality of users in the ecosystem. So that is uh, the the starting point would be to really uh, look at 
you know, things like India Stack, which I think is more an infrastructure than a platform. Uh, it allows platform business models to be created on top of it, but it's an underlying infrastructure uh, that uh, enables uh, all these platforms. So uh, that do the current set of digital infrastructures address all the requirements that are there for the platform business model to solve a specific kind of problem in the, in the rural area. That That is, uh, for example, something that uh, I, I would start by looking at. So if it's a financial services uh, platform and if it's about providing micro loans, is there, is, is the right existing infrastructure, does the right existing infrastructure exist to uh, digitize or determine credit worthiness of individuals? And once we have the right infrastructures provided in the commons, then in, encourage platforms to be created on, on top of these. And as more platforms are created, uh, they will solve new problems, provide infrastructure, provide components back into this underlying infrastructure. So that's how I would expect, uh, you know, an approach in, in the rural context, uh, depending on, um, uh, obviously the, the specific use cases would be different. The, uh, the behaviors would be different. So the, the way the platform is architected would be different from the traditional model uh, or the urban uh, counterpart of the same platform. But I don't see a, f a fundamental difference or in how a platform business works as long as the underlying infrastructures are set up in the rural context. Uh, thanks a lot for that, uh, uh, Sangeet. Uh, I was, you know, I can't call it a similar question, but there are two questions from our uh, uh, YouTube channel, uh, both uh, relate to healthcare. Uh, so one is uh, uh, one is from Sunil uh, Bhattacharji, uh, who uh, who asked. My question is: Post COVID, uh, how can healthcare providers benefit from a business model uh, that is structured like a platform? And uh, there is another interesting question from my colleague uh, Swami, who asked if who World Health Organization. Uh, was run as a platform, uh, how would they have handled the COVID crisis? So if you can kind of address this. Okay, it's a little difficult to answer the second one without fully knowing how the, the World Health Organization runs right now, but I'll take a stab at it. Um, uh, Post-COVID, um, I think the, 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 the starting point is that there is the longer COVID as an the longer the current COVID scenario lasts, lockdown or not, and you know travel bans or not, uh, the more likely it is that we are going to see deregulation of healthcare data and more openness in healthcare data. And um, there's al already evidence towards this. Uh, Belgium, one of the most stringent data privacy advocates, is now working with uh, uh, platforms to to uh, st start sharing and analyzing data. So if so, one of the first things that's going to happen is just uh, much more openness in at least uh, at, at a minimum population level health data and hence greater uh, innovation and research cap capacity unlocked because of uh, this this information uh, being available in potentially the commons or in some kind of uh, more uh, some more open format so that's uh, one uh, you know that's one key element the second thing is that uh, if you look at the US, for example, uh, telemedicine has uh, gotten a big acceleration during this period. Telemedicine did exist to some extent, but it was always augmenting uh, real-time visits uh, or, or in-person visits. Uh, and now for a lot of non-essential um, visits, telemedicine has been made mandatory and has been accelerated. So. Uh, the more the longer we start the more we start seeing behavior shifts real behavior shifts happening towards telemedicine the more we'll take that channel seriously and create new innovation to act, actually deliver care over there because right now care delivery still happens uh, at at a facility uh, it's just augmentation that happens over telemedicine to a large extent uh, and the more we start seeing uh, uh, you know innovation in that direction the more we'll start seeing platform based remote models or more orchestrated models reaching um, other non-city uh, areas for that delivery to be provided, especially if you look at um, you know places like Africa, where uh, there are a lot of uh, care providers, but there's very little training. Um, we in in a in a post-COVID world, I would expect that uh, they would or you know with with uh, acceleration in 
um, telemedicine and in remote medicine, I would expect there to be a greater shift towards uh, enabling the edges of the network rather than just the, the super nodes, which are the current care facilities and the current hospitals. So uh, you would reimagine uh, a healthcare network, not just as a collection of uh, central hospitals, but as uh, an extended collection of uh, uh, you know, smaller facilities where, um, especially in, in, in developing nations where there's a lack of uh, highly trained doctors, you would have alternate forms of training to get them equipped. And all of that, all of this being managed in a platform-based model where you're uh, centrally managing the user's data and determining how you move them across this network of care facilities on the basis of that. So um, I would expect that uh, because of uh, this, this shift towards telemedicine, I, I don't, uh, you know, what history has taught us, what uh, Web 1.0 and Web 2.0 have taught us is that uh, we are unlikely to see complete channel shifts in anything. We are more likely to see new behaviors created because of a channel shift. So people won't, didn't stop going into stores, people started showrooming. So that was a new behavior that was created because of a shift to online. So uh, we'll start seeing new behaviors in, uh, in how patients uh, interact with healthcare services and we'll start seeing this new, the architecture of how these healthcare services are currently set up and, and distributed. So, um, so, th so that would be my uh, you know, view on the first piece. On the second piece, um, I don't understand WHO very well, uh, specifically how they are organized currently. But if you look at um, if, if you look at uh, organizations in general, which are uh, multi uh, uh, you know international organizations, which are multilateral organizations, have uh, multiple um, you know have complex governance structures. A lot of these uh, were built in the pipeline world and still work in that model. They they create uh, they they put out um, they they create a certain mission or a project and then they equip someone to deliver it and then it works in a very linear uh, model. Uh, what's uh, missing to a large extent over here is decentralization and better uh, data collection, better data flows, so which you can manage a much more decentralized international organization. Um, and uh, this, you know, in, in the last, I would say 40 to 50 years, geopolitically also, we've seen m more shifts uh, away towards smaller um, uh, multilateral relationships rather than multilateral rela relationships only at a global level. So I would expect that global organizations in a platform world would work in a more decentralized way with more data sharing, with more uh, distributed governance. Uh, I don't expect them to uh, leverage technology in, in such a, or, or I don't expect technology to play such a, a decisively different role that it completely uh, changes the um, the interface or the channel or, uh, you know, makes, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the channel shift or the interface shift is the least, uh, is the most easy to predict, but it's the least likely to happen. What is more likely to happen is a shift towards more of uh, a decentralized architecture for something that is as centralized as, as WHO. Um, and so um, broadly, that's what I would uh, think of uh, in terms of multilateral organizations and national organizations in general. Um, I have a, a question for you, Sangeet. Given the accelerating growth of the platforms and their power, do they widen and deepen inequality across the world in terms of income, power, social, economic, etc.? And also, uh, how do we mitigate this? So, uh, platforms. Um, when we when we use the term platforms, we're we're talking very broadly. Um, they are they are very uh, that there are different types of platforms. So, uh, the impact that they have on inequality is also uh, has has very different manifestations. Uh, at a at a very broad level, I would say that there are two different types of platforms. There are orchestrators who create markets and control the demand and supply and match the two sides and orchestrate them. That's the Amazon marketplace, for example. And then there are infrastructure providers and enablers, which uh, are also called platforms, but which essentially provide infrastructure to producers who then create something and amplify it to, to consumers. So Shopify would be an example of that. So if you think of Amazon Marketplace with the Shopify, there's the orchestrator versus 
uh, the infrastructure provider distinction. Now, if you really think of these two things, what's really di uh, distinct in the two cases is what is the control point of the platform? In the case of an orchestrator, the control point is the demand side behavior and the demand side data. And in the case of an infrastructure provider, the control point is the supply side infrastructure. And so when we see orchestrators versus enablers, enablers tend to, uh, orchestrators tend to create uh, greater inequality because orchestrators rely on reputation systems uh, and with reputation systems comes the ability to uh, you know, have feedback loops, the more, the higher, higher your reputation, the, the, the higher you get ranked, the more business you get. So there's an organic inequality that comes in within the platform's ecosystem because of a reputation system. And uh, enablers, because they don't have this same dynamic, may end up uh, or typically end up having less of this kind of an, an impact. Uh, so that's one element which has, which creates inequality within um, the ecosystem. The other distinction that's important to understand is whether a platform is enabling uh, merchants or producers or, or service providers who provide a differentiated service or who provide a commoditized service. So think of uh, Uber or Ola that is a commoditized service to the extent that you don't really care who's driving you. You just want to go from point A to point B and the algorithm decides who drives you. But uh, it, on the other hand, if you're thinking of hiring a designer on Upwork, that is a highly differentiated service. And so you need to determine their reputation. You need to decide who you want to work with. And what ends up happening is that the more commoditized the service mediated by the platform, the more the platform needs to standardize and simplify the decision for the user and so it takes up the decision from the user and the algorithm makes that decision and so the the pla the 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 power shifts from the producer to the platform because it's no longer in the hands of the producer to uh, to uh, influence the consumer to make a decision so the more commoditized the service the more likely is it that the platform will control the producer rather than empower them and because of this, if you look at uh, things like food delivery platforms, where again, the service is commoditized, uh, Uber and Ola, if you look at low level, uh, uh, you know, uh, work, uh, uh, work at which is not, which is highly commoditized, like, uh, um, you know, coming in and cleaning a house, for example, uh, at a very, uh, uh, in, in the informal economy was, versus highly sta uh, highly specialized services like a designer or the developer, the negotiating power shifts away from the platform to the pr producer in the case of highly specialized services. So what ends up happening is that because of these two types of, uh, as more and more work moves into the onto platforms and into the platform economy, the more unskilled you are, the more likely you are to not be able to create new opportunities and to get exploited by the algorithm. And the more skilled you are, the more likely you are to be able to differentiate yourself on a platform and create more opportunities for yourself. And so to a large extent, I, I feel that uh, for commoditized work, for um, a lot of blue collar commoditized work platforms and for profit platforms are actually not a solution. They're, they're actually exploitative. And so if you really want to create work platforms uh, in, in the lower end work, uh, a not-for-profit platform is a better way to go about it. So it's this distinction, uh, whether a platform is an orchestrator or an enabler, and whether the platform is managing commoditized work or non-commoditized work that really starts determining how it's impacting inequality. And eventually, we've already started seeing this once users, I mean, there have been surveys that have shown that once uh, drivers or delivery providers move to platforms that uh, provide this kind of commoditized work, it becomes very difficult for them to find the time to upskill and move to highly differentiated services. And that exacerbates the inequality even further. Thank you. Uh, Sangeet, uh, the platform strategies that are adopted by governments, mm -hmm. Singapore has a platform strategy, China has a platform strategy. Are they any different? Uh, do are they more? Uh, uh, you know, uh, do they create more equal societies, or is it more like it? Uh, uh, what is the balance of power between the state and the citizens there? You know, can you kind of give a couple of examples from both Singapore and uh, China, also which you have studied? Sure. Um, 
I, I, I look at uh, um, I look at country level platform strategies as uh, a way to increase competitive advantage for countries in a global world, uh, in a connected world, right? So um, to, to explain the country as a platform model, the, the model that I take is that of Android. So if you look at Android, Android is uh, a multi-party platform, which essentially has three key components. One is that it has open infrastructure, which is the Android operating system. The second, as I mentioned earlier today, is that it has an important control point, which is Google Maps. So you cannot just take Android and create your own handset uh, and not follow Google's rules uh, if you want maps. So you have this open infrastructure and you have a very important control point. And the third thing is that Google, to a large extent, tries to be um, neutral. It does not try to create a car. It does not try to create a uh, handset or does not go very well with that ambition even if it has created hands at some point. The point is that uh, Google has uh, consistently been fairly neutral on that point. So um, when we think about country level platform strategies, they need to think in a similar way. They need to think about what could be open infrastructure, what could be a key control point, and how could they be neutral so that they have an important geopolitical position. So when I, uh, you know, when I worked on this uh, for Singapore, um, the key question that uh, the country was trying to answer was once trade moves online and becomes digital, um, Singapore ha today has a control point on physical trade, which is east west trade. And so its strategic location allows it to have a control point. Now, multiple things are happening. Trade is moving digital because of platforms like Alibaba. Uh, China's Belt and Road is threatening to pull trade away from uh, this, this side. And uh, east west trade in general is going to go down even more so post COVID-19 as people try to, as countries try to build local supply chains. So because of all of this, um, there's been this question of how does Singapore create a control point in uh, virtual or a digital trade? And uh, the, the strategy I proposed to them was essentially this, that um, Singapore needs to think just like Android and provide critical trade infrastructures to the rest of the world. So critical port infrastructure, critical uh, uh, local, uh, uh, you know, SME digitization infrastructure, and uh, essentially be the central place where all these trade infrastructures are created. And again, uh, the infrastructure in itself is not the platform. It's always the infrastructure with the control point that becomes a platform. So create these trade infrastructures, provide it to other parts of the world, allow them to use it uh, and, and the proliferation of the, the infrastructure drives standardization. And that standardization allows one single standard to emerge over time, but at the same time, to create greater competitive advantage for your country, uh, deregulate and, and attract complementary control points. So if you're providing trade infrastructure to other countries, uh, pro provide the right FinTech capabilities here so that eventually the data flows come back to Singapore when uh, uh, when uh, a loan has to be provided or uh, a credit worthiness has to be determined. So uh, own the critical IP over here, even though the low bank in the local country and the ecosystems in the local country may uh, uh, operate, but the API calls will be made back to Singapore, if you will. And through that, create a strong control point of being the hub of all trade related fintech and supplement that with a free data port so that uh, you know, uh, data that comes from, say, Bulgaria is uh, governed over here by Bulgarian laws inside a certain sandbox. So that was the idea that you you create this uh, global platform strategy by proliferating infrastructure, uh, creating control points over here, and having uh, uh, some level of neutrality. Now, to a large extent, we've seen um, China follow a similar model, except that uh, in the case of China, the public-private divide is is a little hazy uh, because the public has a uh, you know the public sector, the government has a lot of uh, interest in private sector, and private sector participants are part are part of the government as well. So, if you look at China, China has is kind of following a, a three-pronged uh, platform strategy, and with COVID, it would increase even further. Uh, so, um, there would be at least one more uh, leg to that platform strategy. So, China's platform strategy is built around the Belt and Road Initiative. And it's built around what is called the Digital Silk Road, which is a set of digital infrastructures that are uh, that China provides to different parts of the world. So the first set of digital infrastructure is in trade. 
Alibaba provides something called, uh, uh, you know, the uh, world trade platform, electronic world trade platform, which essentially sets up digital free trade zones in different countries, digitizes uh, commerce, but then the control points, which is all of Ant Financial's uh, um, uh, risk mitigation algorithms and credit scoring algorithms, all of that are part of the central platform, in, uh, which is China as a country. Uh, the second, uh, the second key uh, foot to the stool is uh, is that Alibaba uh, is is that China through Huawei is providing critical digital infrastructure for smart cities to cities along the Belt and Road Initiative, but all the learning models of how to orchestrate these cities, how to manage city services, they'll decide centrally in China. And so there's again, that open infrastructure versus control point distinction that, that comes in. The third uh, vertical in which this is happening is in national um, uh, identification services. So Venezuela, for example, for its entire elections and national identity uh, scheme use China's identity management platform. And China is now trying to provide that because of COVID to all other countries uh, as a way to, uh, you know, uh, help those countries track the spread of COVID, for example. And that is why managing the narrative is also very important in this kind of a scenario. And I guess the fourth piece that China has always been exporting has been surveillance technology. And that, again, has, has potential to be infrastructure as part of this larger platform strategy. But if you just think of trade, cities, and identity, those three are key components to creating control points across the Belt and Road uh, that China is creating. So that's a very strong, um, uh, compelling platform strategy that they've been pursuing over time. And it's fascinating. Uh, I have a somewhat related question, right? Uh, uh, there is, uh, in the real world, there are, there are these digital platforms and uh, there are things happen that happens outside platforms. To take an example from Singapore, uh, I mean, it had a, a hugely uh, praised uh, the contract, uh, contact tracing app. Uh, but, you know, uh, suddenly we, you know, everyone was praising it. Uh, and suddenly we have the second wave of, uh, uh, you know, infections coming up. So my question broadly is, uh, now, what are the dynamics between uh, the, uh, you know, the on the on platform world and the off platform world, and uh, how how exactly uh, uh, do you deal with it? Uh, because I am sure that uh, it is not the, just the countries, but also businesses uh, will often have to deal with this uh, question. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't get the exact question. What do you mean by the dynamics between the on platform? The, uh, you know, for example, take uh, Singapore, uh, the contact yeah. tracing app. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it seemed to work pretty well, uh, but suddenly you have uh, the uh, you know the infection rates in Singapore go up, uh, probably for reasons that has nothing to do with the app, sure. right? Yeah. Sure. Um, so that's uh... right. So uh, so I, I think um, they are um, with with. If, if you take the Singapore contact tracing app uh, thing, for example, uh, the Singapore contact tracing app worked very well for the use case that it was supposed to work for, which was enabling people with smartphones in the higher and, you know, people who were getting access, who are, who are information, uh, you know, who are consuming enough information about COVID uh, to uh, to empower the government by providing the right data uh, to the government, right? So it it helped. Uh, it 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 performed quite well. What the uh, it performed quite well within the boundaries in which it was supposed to perform. The challenge was that uh, most of the uh, new cases came uh, uh, in uh, in the in the in the migrant labor com community of Singapore where. Uh, which uh, which is almost Singapore's Achilles heel uh, in a way in this kind of a crisis where there are questions about how they are, they are, uh, their living conditions are, for example. Uh, but contact tracing app or not, something like this was bound to happen when, when there are 16 people living to a room, for example. So I guess the, 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 the question that that leads to is uh, what are the, the real world challenges that just prevent your platform business from being effective. And in a case like this, if you uh, believe that Singapore is just a country of highly uh, uh, information aware people with smartphones who are willing to give up their data. And 
I, I think a sizable portion of the population would check all those three boxes. If that was the case, there was nothing wrong or this was a, a really good strategy to try something like this. But the fact that they, there was such a large part of the population which, which did not check these boxes and had other boxes that, uh, you know, uh, other conditions, met other conditions that uh, propagated the disease faster uh, was the issue. So in general, if, if you're trying to create a, a platform solution to an ecosystem, and if you don't create something that can, that can be widely used across the ecosystem to solve the problem, um, you would end up not solving the problem effectively enough. Uh, an example of this is simply how electronic health records have been structured in the healthcare industry. Um, the, it's been created with the right motivations of digitizing patient data, but it's not been created in any way to provide ecosystem wide scale. It, it in a way, it kind of suffers uh, from the same issues that all enterprise software has had in the pre platform world, which is that by over customizing and over protecting uh, something, you end up removing any option for interoperability or reusability of that infrastructure. And that's what's happened with electronic health records, for example. So I, what's important is that you need to understand to, to really take a stab at uh, that question, uh, taking these two examples, Singapore and EHS, you really need to understand what assist, what are the what are the requirements for a system wide solution through a platform business model and are you satisfying those constraints or not uh, you might have designed it with the right set of constraints but somewhere down the roadmap you may have veered from it because of which it no longer is a systemic solution it's no longer even a platform it's ended up becoming uh, something completely different and and it's en ended up becoming just a piece of software for example um, so that's that's where um, it's really important to always start with a view of the system and identify exactly what the platform is trying to achieve and what are the conditions under which that solution will work and then always test whether those conditions still apply. Yeah. Uh, I have a question from YouTube and after this we'll go to Sriram Anuradha. Uh, uh, so the question is from Kavyata. Uh, and she says, uh, given what you said about inequality getting exacerbated, what is the incentive for low skill producers to be on platforms? Uh, in the post COVID world, uh, isn't there a possibility that consumers trust low producers, uh, low skill producers for individually known to them rather than those on platforms? I think, um... So let me uh, answer the first question. The, the challenge is that a lot of these low skilled producers do not have any other opportunity if they don't participate on the platform or do not have a, a comparable opportunity. Um, in many cases, that is also because when they participated on the platform, the platform was growth hacking and so it had favorable policies. But then once enough network effects got created, they changed their policy. Then this has happened again and again with companies like Deliveroo and Uber and so on. Now, the challenge is that because low skill producers do not have the, the wealth of choice that uh, a high skill produce, uh, you know, worker has, uh, they end up working on these platforms and uh, the, the solution to this is not uh, uh, possible at the worker level because the, that level of agency does not exist for the worker today. So the solution has to be at the level of the platform or at the level of the regulator. So the first thing that's important is that regulators, going back to uh, you know, Srinivasan's question, uh, when you have certain conditions, a regulator needs to determine whether something is the platform's responsibility or something is the producer's responsibility. And in the case of work, the condition should be a level of agency. If you're providing a certain level of agency, feel free to call them entrepreneurs and let them handle their own thing and call them a contract worker. But if you're controlling how work gets allocated to them, the conditions under which they work, the, the algorithmic metrics they need to uh, satisfy on a daily basis, then classify them as a worker. So this is uh, the first thing on which you know debate has been raging and there have been a whole set of binary approaches to it, um, which have ranged from you know banning the platform to just continuing and code for many days. Um, so the first thing is um, that platforms need to own up and take more responsibility when they're controlling the ecosystem and not really working like a platform. They are just working like an extended algorithmic organization where the algorithm is the middle manager and manage, managing these drivers externally. 
The, the second piece uh, here is that to create agency, you also need to uh, reduce the platform's control over the worker. Now, I talked about reputation systems and what's very important is that reputation systems are not one size fits all. In a platform like Yelp or Airbnb, where the producers are differentiated and specialized, a reputation system is a measure of quality. But on a platform like Uber, where they are commoditized, a reputation system is just a mechanism to mete out punishment because you are not provided a greater payout if you have a higher rating. You're only removed from the platform if you have a lower rating. In these cases, reputation to some extent should be put out in the comments so that the portability of reputation becomes much easier so that uh, drivers are able to or workers are able to move from one platform to, to the other while putting their reputation. Today, a lot of workers do not move onto platforms because they do not have a resume anymore or have any back background uh, for the work that they've done to show on this new platform. And so creating a common uh, uh, reputation layer uh, in, in cases where reputation is not empowering but is punishing would be uh, another important opp opportunity over here. What, what you could do is create a dual reputation system where the basic reputation is portable and then very specialized things uh, which are unique to the platform may not be portable. Uh, but in some way or the other, that level of portability needs to happen. Uh, a third thing is uh, uh, if you really want to create agency for the producer, you need to uh, allow some level of data openness. Think of it like a, uh, a worker API. If I'm a worker, I can take my, take, uh, you know, not a data dump because everybody provides a data dump, but I can take an API connection out of the platform and connect it to a third party app. And the third party app can, lobby on my behalf. Once enough workers have connected to it, it can identify uh, variations and patterns and on the basis of that negotiate with the platform. Uh, for, if, you, if we want solutions to scalable systemics, uh, uh, you know, uh, business models like platforms, we need to have systemic solutions like this, where uh, we can fight the platform with data, with uh, large scale connectivity to its APIs. So, um, it's, it's what's missing today is this lack of agency. So that was the first question. There was a second question, which is about COVID-19. Uh, post COVID-19 won't users want to have this kind of a relationship. The, the, the challenge is that uh, there's a real cost to managing the, and maintaining relationships. And uh, for when the, when the uh, work that is involved uh, or when the, uh, when the convenience is so high that for example, in the case of, uh, finding a driver. If you're just going, uh, if you're not going for something specialized and do not need a particular specific type of car, finding the nearest driver is much more convenient than having somebody who you call and then you negotiate, are you available, not available, and all of those additional aspects. So it's, it's going to come down again to um, what is the cost benefit uh, equation and, and uh, uh, where the cost of uh, working with an unknown person is higher, they, their consumers may forge these relationships, but otherwise it's, it's, it's difficult. And, and that is why in specialized services, the cost of working with an unknown person is high and the benefit of working with a known person is high. So that is the reason why the, the power shifts back in the direction of the ecosystem. I have a question about scaling platforms. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, in your book, Platform Scale, you write about the need to scale interactions with the four key actions of creation, curation, customization, and consumption. Can you please elaborate on this? So um, the idea, uh, the essential idea uh, that, um, that I uh, wanted to put forward in Platform Scale was uh, that creating a platform is not about technology, it's not about beautiful interfaces, it's not about great algorithms, it's fundamentally about ensuring that the interaction that you are uh, enabling is efficient and is repeatable. And um, this is important because uh, there is, uh, you know, when, when you say it's not about technology, people say, yes, it's about user experience, which is fine if you're just creating software or if you're creating a product, but if you're creating a platform where multiple uh, different parties contribute to the user experience of every other party, <clears throat> focusing on the interaction is critical. And so, um, 
the the key idea was don't build the software or the infrastructure or the set of tools and services without a view of the interaction don't build it optimized for one user don't build it optimized for good technology build it focused on the interaction so that was the idea of the interaction now the interaction in itself has uh, four different components there is a producer who creates value and a consumer who provides something in return and so the producer has to create value the consumer needs to consume it but at scale you have many producers creating value and many consumers creating values uh, consuming values so two important considerations come up once you have a lot of producers creating value the search costs increase and so <clears throat> you need customization you need to ensure that the thing that is most relevant to a particular consumer is is provided to that particular consumer so it's customization or personalization of what is served to them and the second thing that's important is that at scale you also need to ensure that you have a scalable way to manage uh, quality and that is what curation uh, focuses on so that is that is the key idea of creation curation uh, customization and consumption my question is about this algorithms we talked about how a lot of these uh, platforms are doing data driven algorithms and that becomes the center for their uh, competitive advantage and in 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 this kind of a world we talked about how apis have to be open and all of that you think there is a role for the governments to push for openness of these apis or you think that the platforms themselves should voluntarily open this out um so your question is about openness of apis or um openness of data or transparency of algorithms or some combination of we're talking about openness of the apis mm -hmm. uh openness of the algorithms uh rather than the openness of data okay um so openness of A apis um openness of apis so when you think about platforms in general platforms open apis wherever they can benefit from external innovation so there is obviously an organic need for platforms to open up apis anyway uh, beyond this um if if you are thinking about the role of governments that would come from the perspective of are there specific control points on the platform that the platform is not opening access to and that would then be the decision factor is there a specific control point which the platform owns because of which it is exploiting the ecosystem is there a specific um, uh, you know if we if we take just uh, the google maps example is there a specific form of ip uh, because of which a platform is uh, restricting or hindering innovation in the rest of the industry and is gradually commoditizing other players in the industry should that be open so that uh, I, that that would be the lens in terms of is there a negative impact of a closed asset at the platform end which if opened would encourage greater innovation without necessarily uh, impacting the competitive advantage of the platform because you always have to balance uh, industry wide innovation versus firm level competitive advantage so that would be the lens that uh, i would uh, have and that is the lens with which uh, i would I, i had mentioned the the idea of open reputation and dual reputation as well open out the reputation to the extent that it does not commoditize and, and enables portability but don't open it to the extent that it uh, eats into the competitive advantage of the platform so that is in that's uh, that is what i would expect in terms of openness uh, go, if we have to go beyond the organic openness that exists today uh, which is entirely driven by uh, the the firm's needs then uh, we we would have to take this control points and exploitation uh, framework the uh, second piece about um, transparency of algorithms um, uh, is um, you know uh, to a large extent um, wherever um, and again there, there is no one size fits all over here and and uh, the way i would think of it is that to to the extent that algorithms can be traced and that their workings can be traced um there should be some mechanism for which algorithms can be audited just like we audit companies for their finances there should be some ongoing mechanism by which algorithms and their workings can be audited and uh some boundaries uh, based on which uh, there's it is determined which kinds of 
deep learning algorithms, non-traceable, can be applied to which types of problems. So that potentially restricts innovation to some extent, but again, I would have the same uh, you know, hat on over here because algorithms and the learning models that are created uh, are essentially control points. And so if you cannot regulate the control point, if you, if you're not, if you cannot completely open it, you at least have the, you, sh you should at least have the ability to audit it so that a firm does not exploit activity in the ecosystem towards its own benefit. So that is the central framing that I would use. Uh, as a regulator, identify what are the control points in a certain ecosystem, which firm has those control points, and what, is, what are the right sets of regulations, ongoing audits, checks and balances, design frameworks, based on which we manage uh, the exploitation of those control points. Uh, you had uh, described uh, how uh, Singapore can, um, you know, uh, play the role of a platform in global trade. Is this also possible in the realm of stock exchanges, since Singapore is also a large financial center? Or uh, does the speed and settlement issues uh, come in the way of this? Um, I, I, I can't comment on the settlement issues per se because uh, uh, I'm not an expert on that specific topic, but uh, from uh, from the perspective of providing key um, comp key infrastructural components to other stock exchanges, um, you would uh, you know the set the 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 a lot of the the need for speed and settlement could be handled at the edge at the node, um, as long as uh, there is some important control point for which. Uh, the stock exchange still needs to, or the individual stock exchanges still need to rely on the host country, you could have a similar platform strategy. Uh, the, another way to do uh, uh, a platform strategy could just be to, to deliver um, infrastructure, uh, you, you know, to stock exchanges, digital infrastructure, just to standardize all of that activity and then identify other complementary activity, uh, which that can be connected to. So, for example, you could provide uh, infrastructure to stock exchanges, but then you could provide uh, and and you don't try to control that, just provide it and create a standard. But then you provide uh, linking fund management capabilities and open that out to different funds and uh, family offices and provide them the ability to manage funds in a new way for the first time and then create control points on that. So um, there, there are potentially ways to think about the feasibility uh, in that scenario as well. Um, this is how I would uh, approach it. Uh, Sangeet, one, one question here was, you know, it's a, a viewpoint and a question. Actually, if you look at, and we're coming to the post-COVID world, the fact is economies actually survive on inefficiencies. Mm -hmm. because jobs are created, consumers are inefficient, businesses are inefficient, people don't want to travel far to eat, people don't want to take, people want to pay more for brands. And small businesses or large businesses essentially could bundle services and other components with their offering, right? As a, as a counter to, let's say, the digital tsunami. But now with that window closed, essentially, you don't want to be serviced anymore because you don't want to have contact, right? You want to reduce contact. So of course, they'll, there'll be new bundles coming. But essentially, if businesses become too efficient, so will we see a violent reaction like from governments as well, like we are seeing against globalization? If, China added so much efficiency to the world that businesses stopped manufacturing all over the world. And now we are seeing a counter trend emerge where countries are saying, even if it's inefficient to manufacture locally, I need to do that because I need to, you know, have uh, survive in some manner continuity. And the same thing will happen on platforms as well. You can't infuse too much efficiency into a market because the destruction will be unimaginable. Yeah, um, I so if if I take the if, if I work off the China example on this one, um, yeah. I, I think the issue that that has uh, that has come up is uh, that extreme efficiency has come at the cost of resilience. It's come at the cost of uh, uh, you know not just um, infrastructural resilience, but uh, broader, uh, uh, you know, system-wide resilience in terms of uh, the the way workers currency. are, uh, you know, the working conditions in China and how that led currency to currency as well, and they manage their currencies. Right, 
absolutely but equally the same it holds for vc money venture capital mm-hmm. the amount of liquidity available in the world which will flow into digital assets has the potential to destroy i mean in a sense if you decide that you want to be really efficient with your business you want to be really efficient with deployment of capital you can essentially destroy millions of jobs globally on a permanent basis right yeah so um so so i i mean um uh, if your your question about efficiency is is um i mean how do you define efficiency in this case because uh, yeah, assume everybody starts selling at marginal cost look what's happened to the oil business right i mean look at what's happening suddenly when you see crude oil pricing dramatically dropping because now coming down to who is the lowest cost producer who's got some natural advantage built in built in and he's destroying all other firms in the market right a similar thing will arise on platform digital platforms are well funded commoditize the players players will then go out of business right so essentially you find that the same phenomena i'm saying we are seeing a huge push back on against globalization that's happened was already underway it happened through politics and would have hit economics later but i think those trends will now accelerate uh, because there's no choice C- countries have to now create local capacity and capacity will not go to the most efficient supplier anymore because other elements will come into play so i'm saying much like what's happening on globalization will that again be something that very quickly governments around the world have to realize that if a platform comes backed by a huge wall of vc capital it's a disastrous thing to happen to a market so you know regulations will have to move much faster uh, in this uh, new world where traditional players are left with nothing they they then they were not digitally savvy to begin with and they now have no bundle of services uh, left to offer offline yes. even showrooming you know at least people used to go to stores for showrooming and probably some generation is to continue buying at the stores now you don't want to go to a store at all right yeah so we, we are sitting on a we are sitting on a precipice for small businesses which needs to be addressed yeah so i understand your your, your question about efficiency it's about it fun, it's fundamentally about value destru- destruction and there are different ways in which that value destru- destruction plays out right one is just through fundamentals just the fact that um they are network effects and uh, learning effects because of which more than more value accrues to a platform and away from the ecosystem then there are uh, cross subsidization uh, issues which is uh, something as simple as amazon web services subsidizing retail in a way that nobody else can or it is softbank subsidizing literally every real estate play in the world in a way that traditional real estate would not have worked with right. so um those um, you know those issues to some extent have have been uh you know some some of them uh, if i just identify these if i just think of these two issues these two issues have been issues in a pre covid economy also in the sense of there there's something because of fundamentals and there's something because of uh, uh, unequal access to capital yeah. uh, and uh, what i guess would happen in a in in a in, a, in the current and a, and a post uh, covid situation uh, the issue would the issues that i expect we should be most careful about our sudden shifts in demand side behavior that are hugely uh, that 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 occur for a certain period of time but then are hugely subsidized and artificially extended to completely kill the ecosystem in favor of that particular demand behavior so uh, if 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 we start seeing something like that then even when things start returning to normal just because a certain behavior is being subsidized it it keeps on continuing and a certain part of the producer ecosystem starts getting starved of of business just because uh, that behavior is being subsidized in the long run so those are the kinds of things we should uh, be be careful about but whether whether covid or not uh, whether you know the current scenario or not uh, i uh, i i i strongly feel that uh, there has to be some level of regulation in terms of what kinds of uh, you know what kinds of consumer subsidies can be provided or what kinds of uh, uh in certain kinds of market what kinds of consumer subsidies can be provided because uh, if you if you don't regulate that you end up destroying the the all the players who are working on the the regular economics without the subsidy yeah 
So, I, I, what I was going to step in and say that earlier they were shooting with machine guns against a guy who had a pistol in a traditional business, but now he's got no pistol left anymore. Right. Yeah. I'm just saying that that acceleration of intervention needs to be done because some of these traditional businesses won't survive the six or eight months and probably two years that COVID will continue to have impact. You know, yeah. we're assuming in our brains, we have assumed that lockdown ends, virus goes away, but actually lockdown ends, virus begins in a way. So, yeah. Somewhere intervention needs to happen at a much faster pace because if you see what's happening in India, companies are able to pivot overnight. You're seeing the food delivery guys starting to deliver groceries already. Yeah. Imagine the able, no traditional firm can pivot overnight, right? Netflix will immediately pivot from uh, putting movies to putting live uh, performances by Bruce Springsteen if needed. But traditional companies don't have those uh, mechanic uh, mechanisms available at all. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, from a regulator's perspective, um, it's uh, the the easiest thing to regulate at this point is potentially how consolidation happens because assets are going to become very cheap. You can, uh, you know, similar to how Australia prevented Chinese firms from coming in and buying companies. Uh, you, that is the first order of regulation that can probably be executed. Uh, post uh, post that, uh, you know, identifying better ways to. Uh, to distribute the current stimulus because the stimulus packages across the world, the way they have been instituted, works well for the large company. There's again a rich becomes richer dynamic over there. It doesn't work well. The the, the more uh, uh, the less qualified you are as a business, the less likely are you going to benefit from it. So, Adam, I would expect that those are the two uh, options that regulators have. But uh, even even with with all of that, it's it's just difficult to prevent some of these accelerations from happening because regulation is is never the hundred percent solution. Okay. Uh, Sangeet, that uh, really brings me to the last question, and I'm uh, totally conscious that uh, we have already three minutes past our uh, deadline. And uh, that question is, you know, if there are a couple of principles that uh, were true in the pre-COVID days and uh, will remain uh, true in the post-COVID days. Uh, what would those be? Um, I guess, you know, I, and so from, from whose perspective, from a business owner's perspective, from somebody who's interested in what shifts are going to happen? Uh, from customer's perspective and business owner's perspective, these two. I think, um, I think from a business owner's perspective, or anybody who's studying business, I'll go back to what I said, I said right at the beginning, and this is the lens that I use. Uh, look for uh, demand side behavior shifts that are happening and hence uh, entire demand side shifts that might happen because of that. Look for supply side shifts that might happen because of disruptions of any kind, logistical, creative, whatever. And then look for where concentration will happen and which parts of the value network will start getting commoditized. All business opportunities will start emerging once once you have this lens to, to look at the, the changes that are happening. So I'll, I'll just summarize with, with that central framework uh, to look at, uh, you know, what's happening at, uh, around us right now. Uh, sure. Uh, that's fantastic. And uh, anything else that you'd like to tell our participants? Uh, if, uh, any final, I mean, words? I, I think, no, it's been a great discussion. Thank you. Um, it's, it's been very multifaceted. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for being a part of this masterclass. Thanks, Sangeet. Uh, uh, thanks, Professor Sriram, Harish, uh, Anuradha. And, uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, all of us, all of you who are watching this from YouTube, and uh, you know, we can continue this conversation on our Slack channel and uh, continue our learning. Uh, thank you so much.